Welcome to uh, Citizens Club Policy Breakfast. A uh, couple of quick announcements. Our annual meeting will be Friday, June 27th. Um, we'll get information out on that and uh, hope you'll be able to make that. The uh, program this morning is, uh, as best we can do it, kind of a progress report on the uh, Illinois legislature. Unfortunately, they're still in town. Um, pardon, yeah, maybe they're gone, I don't know. Anyway, anyway, we have a star-studded group, and uh, with that, I want to introduce Josh Collins. Josh is Director of Government Relations with the Greater Springfield Chamber. And uh, Josh, it's your program. All right. Thank you, Bob. I will uh, introduce the panel and then get out of the way and just uh, watch time on my watch here. Uh, to my left is Jim Reed. He is the Director of Government Relations at the no Illinois Education Association. Jim has formerly served as the Deputy Director of Legislative Affairs and the Deputy Director of Government Affairs at the Illinois Attorney General's Office. Uh, he also has experience in political consulting and tax analysis. Uh, and uh, you have your law degree as yes. well. So. Uh, to his left is Mark Dinsler. He's the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at the Illinois Manufacturers Association. Uh, Mark assumed his current post in January of 2006 and is responsible for all government affairs, membership, and human resources activities. Uh, prior to the IMA, Dinsler served in various posts, including overseeing Illinois government affairs for state farm insurance. He also served as legislative analysis in the General Assembly, focusing on taxes, education, and transportation. Uh, and Mark also acted as liaison to Governor Edgar's Eikenberry Commission on School Funding. Uh, and then to Mark's left is Zach Stamp, uh, who is the principal partner in the firm of Zach Stamp. His practice focuses on the areas of representing clients with, with interest before the Illinois General Assembly and the Illinois Department of Insurance. Zach is the former director of the Department of Insurance, uh, which during his tenure, they implemented mandatory auto insurance and the comprehensive health insurance program, which he chaired. He served uh, three years as Governor Thompson's Director of Legislators, Legislative Affairs in the position he was responsible for coordinating the governor's interaction with the General Assembly, overseeing the legislative activities of the departments and agencies under the office of the governor. In addition, Zach served on the Senate Republican staff from 1980 through 1985, holding a number of different positions, including staff for the Insurance Committee. Um, with that, I will turn it over to the panel. Uh, Mark, I think you're going to go first. I thought for sure picking the middle seat would mean I didn't have to go first. Um, I kind of feel like I'm at school and nobody's in the front row. So the, only, the tickets only go to those that are sitting in the front rows today. Um, I appreciate Josh and Bob and the opportunity to speak today before the uh, Citizens Club here talking about what's happened in legislation. I think Zach made the point before uh, we spoke that what we would have said you know, a week ago or maybe even yesterday is probably different than uh, what we may say today. Um, in, with the introduction, you ask you know, how things are going. Right now we have to give it an incomplete. Uh, for those of us uh, like Jim, Zach, myself, we wouldn't have jobs if the General Assembly weren't in town. So, Bob, they do, they do employ people like us uh, to make sure that your wallets are safe. Um, I would tell you there's, there's a couple big issues that are remaining uh, on the table, and, and certainly the only thing that has to get done uh, by the end of session is passing a budget. Um, that is the primary focus right now of what the governor and, and what the speaker, Senate president, and every member of the General Assembly is focused on right now. The debate essentially boils down to um, the size of the budget and how you pay for it. As business owners know, or the mayor knows, uh, revenue should equal what you spend. The General Assembly for years didn't follow that path, and they essentially put forward a budget, and then they made sure that the revenue matched what they were going to spend. A couple years ago, they actually started doing a revenue estimate first, and then they would match the spending to that. And so the House and Senate earlier this year passed a budget resolution uh, that estimated they were going to have $34.5 billion in revenue coming in this year. Um, they looked at it and noted that the temporary income tax had to expire uh, on December 31, so you would see a cliff halfway through the state's fiscal year. Uh, but the, the budget that the House passed uh, the other day after great acrimony uh, 
funded the budget at about $38 billion. So it essentially assumed that the income tax would be made permanent. Uh, they are having trouble right now in the House getting the votes to make the income tax increase permanent. So the House is going to look at doing a, quote, cut budget, which is the $34.5 billion budget. However, Democrat majorities in the House and Senate don't want to cut spending. So we're going to wait and see. They've thrown a few ideas out on the table uh, yesterday, uh, including the soda tax. Uh, a one cent per ounce tax on soda. If you buy a case at the store, that would add $2.88 to the case of soda. Uh, they're looking at a gas tax, potentially has been uh, laid on the table, a four cent per gallon tax increase. They're actually now talking about just taking the sales tax on gas, using it for a capital program and backfilling with income tax revenue if that's made permanent. Uh, but really, the, the tax issue is out on the table. Uh, we had a graduated income tax proposal most of you probably heard about. Would have eliminated the constitutional requirement that you have a flat tax, and right now there's a ratio that the corporate tax can't exceed the individual by more than 8 to 5 ratio. The deadline to put that on the ballot came and passed, uh, so now they've looked at the uh, making the temporary tax permanent. Um, and. and uh, and there's also discussion, particularly in the House, on incentives, on what they can do to incent business. Uh, as we like to say, our unemployment rate is second or third highest in the country. Uh, we really struggle. We need to make the uh, state of Illinois much more business friendly. So we've been involved in discussions with the House Revenue Committee and State Government Committee and what you can do. And there are things that they're talking about, a possible reduction in the corporate tax rate, eliminating the corporate franchise tax, reducing fees for LLC filers, um, doing some stuff with research and development and the manufacturer's purchase credit. So I think there's a segment of the General Assembly that says, hey, we actually need to do something for the business community to grow jobs. You also have the other side that say, well, if we give incentives away, that's less money to spend on state programs. So that is really the, the debate that's ongoing. Quickly, the minimum wage issue I'll address. Um, minimum wage issue is, is dead for session, actually passing legislation that would increase it. There's a bill out there increasing the wage to uh, 1065 an hour over the next three years. As a, instead of that, because they're struggling to get the votes, the speaker is now moving forward legislation that would put that ballot initiative uh, on the November ballot. So people would be asked, do you want to support an increase in the minimum wage to $10 an hour on January 1st? Um, and the speaker yesterday uh, put forth a proposal of the millionaire's tax, imposing a 3% additional income tax on folks that make more than a million dollars. Um, well, I'm not, I'd love to be in that category someday. Um, it really impacts small businesses um, throughout the communities on the main street. A uh, million dollars in revenue is not a huge amount of money uh, for a company that pays uh, under the individual tax rate and so they're going to put the millionaires ballot uh, probably or millionaire question on the ballot and it's all about driving turnout in the election uh, it's an off presidential year typically the the party not in control of the White House makes gains and so the Democrats are really worried uh, with voter su uh, suppression or suppressed turnout how we can get our voters to the polls and putting things like minimum wage uh, a millionaires tax they think will drive people to the polls and help them uh, come November. Um, with that, I'll turn it over. I don't know, um, Jim or. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to come and <clears throat> speak and be a part of this uh, this panel. Uh, you know, it's interesting uh, here in Springfield. People really, uh, citizens, are engaged in what's going on. And they care about really what's going on at the Capitol. The three questions I uh, tend to get as you go around town is, one, will they, are they going to pass the income tax? Uh, two, what's the court going to do with the pension bill? And have you been to Hy-Vee? Right? So those are the three <laughs> questions you get. And I, I don't know about the third. Hy-Vee is great. I've actually been there once. But it just shows the level of engagement that people have really around these uh, issues. I think this session has been defined, uh, as Mark indicated, really by revenue, and that's really what's driving everything from now until uh, next Saturday, hopefully when they, uh, when they adjourn. Um, but aside from that, there have been a number of other really uh, interesting issues, at least as it relates to education. And of course, everybody likes to talk about education. They like to dedicate revenue to education and sort of make it the, the thing that is either used to, to, to get votes or to, uh, to use to, to beat up the other party. Um, so there have been discussions around Common Core, and there really has been a lot of activity in terms of, uh, of how to address Common Core, not so much the, the, the fact that we have Common Core. I think that's pretty much agreed to, and there's, there's pretty wide range support for it, but really how we get into the implementation of the Common Core standards. Uh, 
So those discussions are going on. Uh, discussions around, I don't know if people remember Senate Bill 7, which was up a couple of years ago, which really redefined uh, uh, teacher evaluations and retention of teachers. So those discussions are going on as well uh, to make sure that the programs and the, the policies that were implemented around education are continuing that they're fair for, for educational employees. Um, of course, we've seen the traditional discussions around gaming that have sort of come and gone. Chicago was a big part of that, and as we have seen, uh, Chicago is no longer really interested in, in gaming, at least as it's been discussed thus far, so we've seen that fall off the table. Uh, and then the charter school movement, which is really big. Uh, of course, we ha are fortunate to have a unionized charter school here in Springfield. Uh, it's really a model that uh, a lot of the other municipalities and, and hopefully uh, Chicago would look to, to uh, implement so we've seen the proliferation of them, but with that has come a lot of discussion about um, accountability for charter schools and, uh, and transparency as it relates to their funding. And then lastly, really, Mark has alluded to it, was the constitutional amendment. And I think for groups like this and the citizens that are here from so many different groups, I think the constitutional amendments on the ballot really provide a unique opportunity to educate the public and for the public to be engaged in public policy debate. Uh, so often, it's dictated by the General Assembly and by the lawmakers, but we're going to have at least four constitutional amendments on the ballot, one relating to voters' rights, one relating to victims' rights, and then the other two that Mark alluded to, the minimum wage, which would set it at $10, and uh, finally the millionaire surcharge. So even though folks may not be necessarily excited about the candidates that are running um, out there on either side of the aisle, uh, there are opportunities to really engage and let the public uh, be educated about these important issues and to really have a say. So would encourage uh, groups like this and your own individual groups that you go back to to talk about it, to educate, and use these next four or five months to really uh, get engaged around those issues. So. Yes, it's me. Uh, thank, you. thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm not going to add a lot to what's been said because they've covered it pretty well, but uh, to Bob's initial comment about the General Assembly reminded me of the, uh, the author humorist P.J. O'Rourke uh, defined a lobbyist as someone you hire to protect you from the people you elect. <laughs> and uh, so we do have a role to play out there, I think. Um, as they've been, the budget is the big issue, and the driver of the budget, obviously, of the decisions is what to do with the temporary tax, extend it, uh, do, or, you know, or not extend it. That, but overlaying all of that is obviously the election. Uh, as Mark said a week ago, if we were up here, I think we probably all would have said the temporary tax is going to be extended. Uh, not too much doubt about it; it's going to happen. Sitting here this morning, I would still probably make that prediction, but not with a lot less certainty than I would have a couple days ago. Uh, if you've been around here very long, you learn pretty quickly that betting against Speaker Madigan is a, uh, you better get long odds, because you're probably, he, he usually wins. He doesn't always win, but he usually wins. So, uh, you know, today is, is probably more a ploy than anything. They're going to trot out at 8.30, the doomsday, but I'm calling the doomsday budget. They're calling the alternative budget. Uh, when I worked for Governor Thompson, we had a bloody stump budget. Uh, <laughs> call it whatever you want. Uh, but it's, set, it's thrown out there to, uh, to terrorize, basically. Uh, and it's, it'll fail. Why would anybody vote for it? The Republicans are going to vote no because they weren't consulted. It's not their spending priorities. Uh, there's no reason for them to be for this. A lot of the Democrats are going to say we can't, we don't like the cuts, we can't, you know, that type of thing. So this is all designed uh, for the theater to say you passed a budget last week, the House uh, that assumed the tax. Today you killed one that didn't assume the tax. What are we going to do? So I, I would still make the prediction today it's probably going to pass eventually. What an observation of years in government, around government, is tough decisions are driven by pain, not pleasure. You got to make people feel pain, and then they will make tough decisions. They can defer pleasure, but they won't tolerate pain for very long. And the difference in the parties is what their pain is. Uh, using stereotypes or generalizations, which are obviously by definition false in some instances, but Democrats 
let's use the stereotype, want to spend, Republicans want to cut. And so those are the things that drive them to make tough decisions. And that, that's what this is all setting up to do. One of the, I don't want to call it a paradox, but one of the uh, things at play here, though, is Speaker Manning has been very successful in an election sense, uh, not only because he can drew the map, which helps immensely, but because he has recruited conservative Democrats to run in a lot of these seats, fiscally conservative Democrats who ran on that platform and continue to, to vote in that way. And so that makes it very difficult for his caucus, just a lot of members in his caucus, to vote for some of this stuff. So uh, he, he has that dilemma that uh, he might not have or wouldn't have, uh, but for some of these conservative Democrats. So uh, we have, it remains to be seen what's going to happen, uh, but in legislative, it's, even though it's only a week away or so, in legislative terms, it's, it's very early. A lot can happen. We've all three up here, we've all seen things uh, fall together or fall apart uh, in a matter of hours. So uh, we have a lot of time. On the election front, uh, it's all about mobilizing the base. A lot of what you see, we've talked about the millionaire's tax, the minimum wage, um, ERA passed out of the House, or excuse me, out of the Senate yesterday. Uh, I was on Senate staff when uh, we had the uh, chain gang chained to the railing, when they threw blood on the floor, and uh, so it was kind of a deja vu to hear those arguments, uh, what, you know, 30 years later, whatever it was. Uh, kind of strange, but that's, that's obviously out there, too, to, uh, to drive uh, voter turnout to mobilize the base. Uh, but it's not just from the Democratic side. Uh, Bruce Rauner has got his term limits out there, which will probably make the ballot. I'm sure there'll be, a, well, he's probably got, certain appears to have enough signatures. Uh, whether the court will uh, allow it onto the, to the ballot's another question. Uh, there's also a remap, uh, re redistricting, uh, initiative out there that probably won't make the ballot because they don't have enough. So there's going to be a lot of things, uh, as Jim said, if you don't like the candidates, there's still going to be a lot of things you can go out there and vote for, and, and that's why they're there uh, to do that. Uh, the Speaker wouldn't let the, the Republicans thought turnabout's fair play on some of this, uh, and they wanted to put a referendum on, on the extension of the income tax, but for some reason that wasn't, uh, isn't going to happen. So there's stuff out there to vote for. Um, we don't know is the answer to, uh, to probably most of the questions you're going to ask. But with that, I'll stop and let you ask questions. Uh, getting to be the moderator, I, I, I get to ask the first question um, since I have chosen myself. Uh, and I'm going to ask you, you guys have all touched on the, the higher picture issues. Well, could uh, maybe you discuss uh, a lesser known uh, legislative issue that you've been working on uh, this spring, whether it uh, has passed or not? Uh, we'll start. Jim, can we start with you? Or do you okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, I made reference to it briefly was the, the charter school issue um, that we've really worked on and, and have really attacked it from uh, several different fronts. So the first ones I made reference to was uh, really on transparency and, account transparency and accountability. Um, we've seen, again, the proliferation of these charter schools, um, but we have not uh, seen the kind of uh, efficiencies and the kind of uh, uh, the record in terms of uh, academic achievement that I think have, have been talked about quite a bit. Uh, we brought in a professor from um, Minnesota who's really done some significant studies on charter schools in both Milwaukee uh, and also in the Minneapolis area and, and really looked at those numbers to see if in fact charter schools had lived up to uh, the expectations in those cities. Uh, we'd found that in many instances they had not. So we have brought him forth to do some similar studies here uh, in Illinois. Uh, that will begin as well it started this month and will go through September. Uh, the other thing that we've tried to look at is, is really uh, as related to charter schools around local control. Um, you know, so much of the charter school appeal process and decisions about charter schools have been have moved to the state level. Uh, we think that, uh, in fact, at the local level is really where there should be the most and greatest input about whether or not to input a charter school. Um, it impacts the schools at the local level. It's at the local school districts that are the ones that are having to uh, pay for the charter schools. So if, in fact, the decision is going to be made to bring one in or out, we believe that should be a local control issue. So in much of the legislation that's been either in the House or Senate, uh, we've 
uh, either taking a position based upon whether or not uh, it increases the level of local control uh, or whether uh, it would in fact decrease that level. So uh, I think that's been a big issue. And then finally, uh, looking at the uh, Charter School Commission, looking to uh, restructure that. Again, it's moved to the state level. We think that uh, if, we're, if we're going to have one, it should be run through the State Board of Education um, or filtered out through some other process. So. I don't uh, have uh, any real high profile issues that, that I can really talk about and most of, uh, given my client base, most of what we do is defense, uh, going back to my earlier definition. Uh, a couple issues and I'll come back to that. Um, I represent the coin machine operators, the video gaming people uh, that have the uh, the video, the now legal video gaming out there. So we've got a couple issues that we've been dealing with, uh, trying to uh, to let's say clean up parts of the act, and also there are now people out there, as you would imagine, who are deciding that even though we've only been up and running about a year and a half, and people haven't recouped or started, even, well, they started, but haven't got close to recouping their capital investment, it's time to raise their taxes on them. So uh, we're dealing with, with that issue as well. Uh, but the cleanup of the act, which is interesting, the mayor's out here, uh, there are now coming into the market what are called sweepstakes games, which are essentially the old gray uh, for amusement only video games uh, that have uh, a component to them where you act like you're playing in a sweepstakes and there is an active group out there going around telling people these are legal, they're fine, they're just like going to McDonald's and getting a Monopoly uh, game or some or opening a, a Pepsi bottle and finding something under the cap. So it's, it's perfectly legal even though after you get your original sweepstakes ticket, which, and these operate a lot of different ways, but as an example, you get your sweepstakes ticket uh, for free and you get two or three plays, but if you want to continue to play, then you got to put in money. And, uh, and you can also write some post office box in you know Ventura California and they'll send you a free coupon so that's 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 their uh, and, you know wait six months for it uh, that's their rationale for how you can really play this for free so it's really a sweepstakes game it's not a gambling uh, and so these these are coming into the market they're competing with the legalized video gaming uh, they're taking them to places where uh, that the cities have either opted out or for one reason or another don't have video gaming yet, or people who can't get video gaming licenses because they have felony convictions and saying, here, you can, you can do these. So we're trying to, uh, to close off that, uh, that loophole uh, in the video gaming area. Uh, as they indicated, I got insurance clients or do insurance work. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that would be entirely boring to even try to talk about. Um, surplus lines and limited lines and uh, re credit for reinsurance, that kind of thing. Uh, so I won't go there. Uh, on the defensive side, and, and Mark has probably played a bigger role in, in this than I have, or certainly has played a bigger role, uh, a couple of defensive things are pet coke, and I'll let him talk about them, I'll just mention them, and carbon tax. Uh, those are, I represent Peabody Energy, uh, largest coal company in the world. Uh, obviously we've got an interest in that, and uh, there are people out there who, who want to shut us down, uh, both at the, at the federal level as well as, as here. And so there's a lot of playing defense on, uh, on those fronts. Um, yeah, I'll touch on a, on a few things, um, particularly in the environmental area, and, and start with the coal and pet coke issue. Uh, Phil is out in the audience, has been a, a key stakeholder in this as well, along with CWLP. Um, so pet coke is a, a product of the refining process, and essentially it's a fine powdery mix, and, and it's stored generally along rivers. It's sold. It's a commodity. And so you had an isolated situation in Chicago in August of last year. Uh, you had the confluence in number of events. You had um, the drought on the river, so they couldn't move the product. So it built up. You had hot weather, um, so it dried out. Uh, and you had two operators, and there's dozens of operators around the state, but you had two operators. One did not have the correct permit from the EPA, um, and the second company had just been bought by KCBX. Um, so you have this August day, you have high winds come through, and some of the black dust blows into the neighborhoods, and so people complain. So instantly, we're a very reactive state, so you had the mayor of Chicago jump in, you had the attorney general jump in, you had the governor jump in, gosh, we're going to regulate it, we're going to ban it, um, and it created a number of problems. So from a from a refinery you have the canadian oil sands coming in um, from canada it's refined there's four refineries in illinois 
the product is then used in manufacturing. It's used in the production of paint, aluminum, uh, brick, cement particularly, so a lot of different things, and, and they were going to ban this product. And so we fought in the Chicago City Council, we fought in the General Assembly um, against the Attorney General and the Governor's Office who were trying to put very restrictive regulations requiring um, piles of pet coke and coal. Uh, to be completely enclosed. So if you think about it, you're essentially putting up a superdome over these piles. Uh, extremely costly, no other state in the country requires it. And, and for Illinois, and except there's one area in Southern California um, because they don't meet a PM10 standard, environmental standard. And so we sat there and we said, you know, it's very easy if you put these very costly restrictions on, not only enclosure, but a whole host of uh, regulations, they're simply gonna move across the border. The jobs are going to move across the state. The revenue is going to move across the state to address a problem that we don't think exists. We already have, as Phil, when he comes to the meetings, every time brings a stack of 80 regulations that coal operators have to deal with and puts them down and says we already have to comply with these. Um, so we've been fighting that legislation. I think the Attorney General is back on version 5 or 6. Um, we keep saying no, keep saying no. We finally sit back, fine, here's what we would like to see, and it's been crickets for the last two or three days. Um, I don't think she liked our answer. So we're fighting that because that's something that would significantly increase the cost of doing business in Illinois. That's something, as Zach was saying, a lot of times from the business community perspective, we can't play offense. I feel like I'm on the 10-yard line defending my end zone. Um, they're constantly attacking. We try to keep the ball out of the end zone. Occasionally, we might get it, move the, down the field a little bit, maybe get a field goal here and here, but certainly not scoring touchdowns for the business community. Um, so you have the, the coal and pet coke issue. And then a, a bigger issue that we've been dealing with again this year and, and extremely frustrating is the hydraulic fracturing legislation. As most of you probably recall, uh, the IMA, which is the head of the Grow Coalition last year, came together with organized labor. Uh, the main mainstream environmental community, the Attorney General's office, the Governor's office to pass uh, high volume hydraulic fracturing regulations. We have the New Albany Shale in Southeast Illinois, which is similar to what you hear in the Dakotas or Texas or Oklahoma. Uh, the possible creation of 50,000 good paying jobs in Illinois, not just down in the energy fields there, but manufacturers of tubes and pipes and pumps and trucking jobs and rail jobs and uh, you name it. It could be a huge economic impact for the state of Illinois. We are now 360 days from passage and the Department of Natural Resources has still not promulgated rules for it. So while every other state continues to go forward, actually the Balkan in North Dakota the other day sent out a release announcing they've produced the one billionth barrel of oil from the Balkan shale. Illinois right now produces about 29,000 barrels a day. Um, this would be significant. Uh, economic development for an area of the state uh, in particular that really struggles. So we have been meeting um, with stakeholders on our own to try to come up with our own set of rules uh, because the Department of Natural Resources so far I think is slow rolling. I think the governor's uh, doing that because of the elections coming up. But that's extremely, extremely frustrating because you have a, a huge economic development activity. And just for some economics of it, um, we, we estimated and, and we, look, we talked to the geologists that you would get about 200 barrels of oil uh, per well. In, in that comparison to the Balkan, which is getting more than 1,000 barrels a day, um, folks that own the mineral rights today, for example, are getting uh, about an 18 percent royalty they're signing. So if you consider the price of a barrel of oil at, say, 100 bucks, they're getting $18 for every barrel. If you get 200 barrels a day, that mineral rights owner is going to get $3,600 per day. Uh, every year and these wells can last between 10 and 30 years. So substantial economic development investment. Actually, if you go um, down to Wayne County, it's kind of the epicenter in other counties, you'll see huge development going on just waiting for fracturing to occur. Um, the Wayne County clerk actually told me a story, now this is about six months ago, um, that the county clerk's office where they have all the land records is not automated. They had collected in the previous 16 months $450,000 in photocopying fees. $450,000 in photocopying fees for Wayne County. Um, and the, the county next door to them had collected 250000 in photocopying fees. So um, the economic development activity for that is huge. And so we are working to, to see if we can get something done on the rulemaking process because DNR, is, is, uh, we believe, is kind of slow rolling that. And two other just quick issues that, that you know, could have an impact. Number one, for any retailers that may be around, and, and, and certainly for the mayor, there's a, a retail licensing bill that's going to be out there if you sell tobacco products. 
Uh, it's just passed the Senate yesterday, so the state of Illinois is going to create now a mechanism where, whereby any store that sells tobacco is going to be licensed. They're going to have to pay a fee. Uh, so that's going to be something new that's going to be coming that's going to pass this year. And then one other issue, I was talking to Josh beforehand, the IMA represents about 4,000 member companies. We're in, you know, whether it's food, chemicals, heavy equipment, you name it. Well, um, we also have a few companies that, that produce baby products. And so one of the bills we're fighting right now is a ban on crib bumpers, the little bumpers you put in your crib. They're safe. The Consumer Product Safety Board has looked at the issue a number of times, and they think they're safe. We have some legislators that, that know better than the Consumer Product Safety Board, and they think these things are not safe, so they want to ban them. And so, you know, again, a small issue that only impacts a handful of companies in Illinois, but it would prohibit Illinois manufacturers and Illinois retailers from selling these. It doesn't prevent you from going online to buying one. It doesn't prevent you from driving to Indiana to buy one of these. Uh, but again, we see a number of these, you know, kind of little smaller issues that impact a, a small sector uh, of the economy and, and, the, and that we fight on a, on a daily basis. All right. Thanks. We'll go to questions from the audience. Yes, sir. Could any or all of you comment on the handicap uh, progress of Senator Andy Menard's education funding? Uh, yeah, Senator Menard's bill uh, really is looking, uh, just for background, really looking to uh, restructure school funding. And it's been, you know, 30 plus years since we've really looked at the school funding formula. Uh, so he has come up with a proposal, his initial proposal was one that really uh, tried to put a greater emphasis on need and really uh, proving need before school funding was given out to the school districts. Uh, we believe that his initial proposal as introduced was a great concept, it's, it was working well. Uh, the challenge has been though, as, uh, as anything, first of all, he didn't have full participation from the House. So while he was doing this on the Senate side, uh, only a few members of the House were participating in the discussions and, and the hearings that lasted pretty much all uh, last summer into the fall. Uh, so. Uh, so when it came time for session, what we found was that Senator Menar was trying to really appease those that had not been part of the process. And so now I believe we are up to amendment number five. Uh, we've seen issues that have tried to address unfunded mandates. We've seen uh, amendments that have tried to address PTEL. So unfortunately, what's tending to happen is that the, the continuation of all these amendments are really eroding, I think, the original purpose of the bill. Um, it may make it out out of the Senate, uh, but certainly probably has little or no life, uh, certainly in the House. So unfortunately, at least for this session, we believe that that proposal uh, will fall flat. But uh, certainly the effort that Senator Menard has put into it and, uh, and the ongoing discussion from the education stakeholders is one that I think will keep the issue alive as we move forward next session. And I, I would just add, uh, I have nightmares about this. Tom Ryder here, who was a legislator back in the day when I was the, the education staffer in the House and dealt with the Eikenberry Commission for, I don't know, a year and a half or two years. And I, I still, when Andy came up with this, I had flashbacks. Um, but, but Andy has looked, to his credit, trying to take this on, but he's looked at half of the puzzle. He's looked at where the money is distributed. He's not addressed the funding side. So he's not looked at the property tax issue or the income tax, how you pay for it. He simply looked at the distribution of how the money goes out. Um, you know, looking at it, I think we have so many categorical programs in the state of Illinois, I mean, 80 or 90, 70, 80, 90, um, that I think w one of the issues is it does help if you consolidate those, you give local control to the school districts. We're going to send you money. You kind of determine how you spend the money, uh, as opposed to the state saying, "Well, here's fifty thousand for gifted education. Here's twenty-five thousand for ag ed. Here's whatever." You know, we, we do think that returns a lot of local control uh, back to local f folks who can decide how best to spend it. But we believe, just in kind of the broader picture, that actually the state needs to undertake a, a thorough tax discussion, and regardless of what they do or don't do with the income tax, uh, the IMA believes you need to look at the entire tax system. We we think you need to look at the sales tax, for example, and expanding that to services, um, look at the income tax, and you know, not that we're advocating tax hikes, but just back of the math envelope, if you were to expand the sales tax to services, and, and we are excluding the three biggest, so take away accounting, law firm, and medical services. Take those off the table. Uh, if you expand the sales tax to services at six and a quarter percent and lower the rate to five percent, a 20 percent reduction, you would generate 1.5 billion in revenue. Um, so we think the best tax system is one that's fair, is broad-based, and I think you have to look at the property tax as part of the whole equation. 
Yeah, I hope this is a labor of love for him because he's going to be at it for a long time. Uh, anytime you start tinkering around with this, uh, you create winners and losers, and that's currently there are, and, and you, you're changing that dynamic. And uh, with, as Mark said, without without more money coming into the system, you're just you're moving it around, and uh, everybody out there uh, thinks they're a loser. Uh, everybody thinks that they should be getting more, and nobody's willing to stand up and say, "Yeah, cut our uh, general state aid uh, or cut our categoricals." It happens, but uh, nobody's for it. So. It, it, a lot of a lot of people have uh, have tried this or variations of it, and it's a noble goal. But I don't uh, I don't see it anytime soon. Yes, Mayor. In, in terms of uh, the making the temporary tax permanent, where do you guys think the votes are actually at in terms of the house, as opposed to what was the roll call that was publicized fairly extensively in the past? last couple of days. The second part is, is the legislation going to be in session this weekend? <laughs> or are they going to adjourn? And they were comments, at least the newspaper article indicated they were adjourn today and come back on Tuesday. And if they don't pass a temporary income tax and make it permanent, will they be back in November? And will that be determined by who's elected governor? Yeah. Um, good question. So I'll, I'll try to hit them all, Mayor. The first is they are gone this weekend. Both the House and Senate have announced uh, when they adjourn today, they'll be gone Saturday and Sunday. I think the House comes back at 1 o'clock Monday and the Senate at 3 o'clock. Um, in terms of where I think the votes are in the House, I actually, what I've been told is they have about 44 to 46 actual votes. Uh, it was a little bit of a game if you saw the headline in the newspaper the other day about only having 34. The governor's office had floated a story that the speaker was just a couple votes short. So I think there was a little payback maybe. He went down to his caucus, just said yes or no, where he at, walked down and said, gosh, there's only 34, kind of showing that you know he's not responsible if it doesn't pass. Um, I, th this is my best guess today, what I think happens. Um, you know, if I'm looking at a crystal ball, and it may change at 10 o'clock today, um, I guess if I were a Democrat, or what I think would happen is I think they pass the budget at $38 billion. They don't pass the income tax hike. Uh, they tell the governor to spend. He can spend half. He can spend a little bit of it at a, at a lesser rate, or he can spend at the $38 billion rate. I think they come to November, and if um, Governor Quinn wins, they pass the tax hike that then funds the second six months of the year, no problem. If Republican Bruce Rauner is elected, they don't pass the tax hike, and they say, here you go. You wanted it. Go manage the budget. I think I think Mark's probably right. A, a good guess on where they're really at. Uh, I mean, I've talked to, to Democrat legislators who I know will vote for it eventually, who are telling me they're on the fence or their nose. Uh, a lot of that, frankly, is just uh, come talk to me. Uh, you know, I, I can be uh, persuaded, but I have to be persuaded. I'm not going to jump up and say, let me vote for it, let me vote for it. Uh, the, but there are people out there doing that. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think the, the 30 number was... Uh, those those are the the willing that are ready to uh, to charge the uh, the cannons the other but there's another 30 out there potential you know, close that uh, can do it uh, or will do it let's put it that way uh, and I think Mark if they don't pass it and I'm still going back to what I said earlier I think that there's a chance a decent chance that they will uh, this that's that's certainly the scenario uh, come back and. You know, do a, do a lump sum budget of some type, let let the governor manage it, and come back in November and do whatever they think they need to do at that point. And if uh, Rauner does win and running a campaign, if they don't need to do this, I think they'll just say, okay, here it is, it's yours, and uh, let's see what you have to do, because they're certainly not going to pass, I don't think, a tax increase so he can rail against it and then spend the money. Yeah, I think both of my, my colleagues are right. I think the number probably, at least what we've heard, is probably somewhere between 47 and 49. But I think really this revolves about around maybe 10 or 12 key legislators uh, who, if they really hear from their constituents at home over these next three days, I mean, the speaker has used this tactic where he sends them home for an issue, lets them either get beat up on it, and then they come back and say, okay, now how do you want to vote? So I think a combination of that um, with whatever projects or whatever they feel like they need to bring back to their district. I've talked to 
uh, at least two legislators that said, you know, yeah, I'm going to vote for it, but like like uh, Zach said, you know, they want someone to come and talk to them. And so, if, if the, you know, we've seen it around marriage equality, other issues that the speaker really uh, either believes that he needs to move an issue or for political purposes needs to help uh, the governor, um, you know, put himself in a better position for November, then I think he'll make the effort and, uh, and secure those votes. Any other questions from the audience? <laughs> Mayor. Okay. Uh, as you look at the legislature, I know you guys don't deal with pensions, but Chicago Cook County has real pension problems. Do you guys have any feelings as to what might be happening again, either now or in maybe <laughs> Well, obviously, you know, we've dealt with the pension issue at the, uh, as it relates to TRS and SURS, and uh, it's now sitting in the courts. So uh, the, the We Are One Coalition, which is a block that includes most of the public, saber, public sector labor unions, have all taken a position in opposition to the city uh, pension proposal. Um, I think it's making the governor's office very nervous about what they're going to do, if they're going to uh, potentially amendatorily veto it. Um, but it was talked about earlier that the, uh, the tax issue in Chicago raises some real concerns. So I'm not sure that uh, it, it makes it uh, during the session. So. Yeah, I, uh, I'm on the opposite take of, of Jim. We think it needs to be done. Um, we supported the pension reform bill last year uh, that passed the General Assembly. We supported the Chicago pension reform legislation. Uh, I know Cook County Board President Tony Preckwink was down yesterday making the rounds, having meetings, and certainly police and fire. I, I sit on the Lincoln Public Library Board here, and we've seen what's happened funding-wise because of pension pressures. Um, so we think that something needs to be done. Unfortunately, I think politics are involved. The um, uh, as they have been for years, unfortunately, uh, and this is for those that say this is a problem created by Pat Quinn or Democrats. This is a bipartisan problem that's created by both sides. Um, they're equally to blame for this. It's it's not one side or another, but um, you know something has to be done. I mean, you're you're managing your budget, and these costs are going up every year. That the General Assembly is passing things and sending you the bill. Um, unfortunately, I, I would probably agree with Jim. I don't think anything is going to happen in the last ten days of session. I don't know what's going to happen with the Chicago pension reform bill that's on Governor Quinn's desk. Uh, some of you may recall, you know, essentially part of it is Chicago has to raise property taxes. That was mandated in the original bill. The General Assembly balked and said, we're not going to be mandated to raise property taxes. We'll allow Chicago to do it. So they passed it. It, it would have some property tax increase. So you now have a governor who said making property taxes one of the cornerstones of his campaign. He's, he's proposed this kind of goofy pledge. We're going to send everybody a $500 check to offset property taxes. I'm assuming it'll come in the mail week before the election with his name on it. Um, but, uh, you know, so property tax is big. So he now has a bill on his desk that if he signs it will result in a property tax increase. So it puts him in an interesting box, uh, you know, and he's only got a number of days before he has to sign it. Um, and, and so, unfortunately, to your, your original question, I don't think anything's going to happen. We think something needs to be done. Something certainly needs to be done. The question is what, of course. Uh, but one of the things underlying a lot of this uh, uh, hesitancy is nobody knows what the court's going to let them do. And why do you want to string, if you're a legislator, why do you want to string yourself out voting to cut pensions or raise property tax or do all this other stuff if the court's going to ultimately invalidate it? And I was from a public policy standpoint, hopeful that the Supreme Court would use their health insurance case, even though it's not exactly on point, they could certainly put some dicta into the uh, decision to give the General Assembly some guidance about how they view that provision of the Constitution. Uh, they've chosen not to do that. So the General Assembly is, is sitting there wondering, you know, what can we ultimately do and why do we want to string ourselves out? Uh, for a year or two, uh, if it's not really going to be whatever whatever goals you want, which pick which, whichever side, uh, you don't know. You don't know. Can you do all of it? Can you do some of it? Can you do none of it? And uh, that puts them in a real dilemma. We should have about time for two more. Yeah. 
Um, I, if, if you couldn't hear the question, the stumbling block on the Chicago casino. Okay. Um, so this goes back when they passed the original casino licensing bill at the time the city of Chicago didn't want a casino. Um, that's why they didn't have one initially. And so r right now you have a number of factors. So you have the, the current casinos, um, and, and Zach is probably a better expert, but you have the current cas casinos that maybe don't want Chicago to have one because of the competition. You have the horse tracks, for example, that see it as competition. Uh, you certainly have the, the thoroughbred tracks and, and those folks that, that may be getting a spiff off some casino money. Uh, you then have other communities that, that say, well, if we're giving one to Chicago, I want one. So the last kind of bigger comprehensive bill, I think they were going to put one in Danville, Waukegan, Rockford, Chicago, and I think the south suburbs. And they did that to get votes quite frankly to you know and so th these these bills get so big ultimately that they fail and um and so i think the biggest stumbling blocks are just you know you have all those parochial interests that you know joliet doesn't want to vote in chicago because it's going to cut into their their potential base so I, I think that's just you know the biggest issue and then governance i think is the second biggest um there's a lot of discussion and everyone thinks chicago is mobbed up and they don't want to give control for example to the mayor they'd rather have the state have control over it um so i think it's a it's a control issue then is probably the second biggest issue yeah, could start with that. Control is is a big issue. Uh, unlike all of the other boats, the city wants to have control of their boat and their license forever in perpetuity, uh, as opposed to the other ten boat existing boats. Uh, I would disagree with Mark on this. I think that the other the ten existing boats would be happy to have a Chicago boat if that was it because they know once Chicago gets the boat, there will be no 12th one. There will be 11, and there will never be a 12th boat. And so Joliet doesn't have to compete with the south suburbs and, and uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, but passing a Chicago-only boat, casino, uh, becomes a real issue, and that's why you start getting all these other groups uh, that you have to start bringing in to try to get their various constituencies in there. Uh, and they all are going to fight a Chicago-only boat because of what I said. They know, I mean, Arlington Racetrack and, and all the, you know, Waukegan knows that if Chicago gets their boat, that's it. The door's shut effectively probably for the rest of everybody's lives in here. So uh, there's a lot of dynamics, but it does get so big, you start bringing in, bringing in the diverse groups and trying to put them at the table with their little piece of the pie, and uh, eventually the boat sinks. Do you want to touch on that? Maybe one more question. Bill. Yeah. One um, way it seems to be you could address a revenue problem would be more people having jobs. Um, what's going on with the legislature regarding moving people who are unemployed, high unemployment rate, into the jobs that are actually already out there? Solving the skills guy, I see education up there, manufacturing up there. So maybe you could talk a little bit about anything that's going on about getting people who are unemployed into the jobs that are out there. Right now. Um, I'll take a crack at this, and, and so we have a big issue in manufacturing. Uh, the industry today employs about 580,000 people, contributes a single largest share of the state's of the gross state product. Um, however, the the job counts down from about 900,000 in the year 2000, so down about 300,000 jobs. Um, you hear about the high unemployment rate, but we still have a lot of unfilled jobs. If you talk to the Economic Development Commit Coordination uh, folks in Macon County, there are hundreds of manufacturing jobs that are open in Macon County right now, and Decatur has one of the highest unemployment rates in the state. Um, generally for two reasons. Number one, they don't have the skills, or number two, they can't pass a drug test or a combination. So the IMA has an education foundation. We are um, working with community colleges in particular, been out at Lincoln Land and others to put what's called manufacturing skill standards in place, where I think in 16 of 48 community colleges will be in 40 of the 48 within about two years, we believe working uh, jointly. It can't be a top-down approach. So working with the community college, the local school district, the local employers to say, what do you need in your area? Because what may be needed in Peoria area may be different than Lake County or different than Rockford, which is more aerospace, or, or down in southern Illinois. So um, you, you have to have buy-in from all the stakeholders, uh, number one. It can't be a top-down approach. Um, you know, there's some job training programs that are that are 
uh, pretty decent, the state, but, but are severely underfunded. Uh, the governor has proposed a bill that we've been working on that I think will be, be passed this year. It's called the I-STEP program. It will be a tax credit against, um, you can offset your withholding tax uh, for training employees, but they have to be net new employees. Um, so not your existing workforce, but new workers coming in. But um, we're, we're really focusing, whether it's, it's, it's the young boy or girl that's graduating from high school, it's decided I don't want to go to a four-year college, but they need some additional training, whether it's uh, the displaced worker who's lost their job, whether it's the veteran that's coming back from Afghanistan or getting out of the service, where they can get these manufacturing skill standards and get right to work. A, a quick story. Um, a guy that runs Caterpillar's worldwide training, uh, it takes, it's about 12 weeks training if you get hired by Caterpillar, any of their facilities. If you come with a manufacturing skill standard, which is national standard, uh, they give you two weeks of training. Uh, you don't need the additional 10. You just need two weeks of Caterpillar specific. So if we can get these in, you get kids you know, or adults up to par and get them in the manufacturing jobs that are, are good, high-paying jobs that are still out there. I mean, just on the education front, you know, everybody talks about education funding and education becomes such a sort of a political football. Um, but a simple thing we can do is start going to smaller class sizes. Um, you know, we've got class sizes. My three kids are in class sizes that range from 22 to 26. I mean, all the studies have shown that, you know, having class sizes around 15 to 17 are much better for our students. If you look at a number of states, Massachusetts and others, they have smaller class sizes. So if you have smaller class sizes, of course, you have more teachers. Uh, um, you have more uh, proficient teachers, better teachers that have happened through the licensure board that has really looked to improve the standards for teachers coming uh, and folks coming into the profession. So that would be a simple way to, to help uh, at the higher ed level. Um, and the funding has been decimated uh, for funding there. And if we start putting some of that funding back and get you know, better trained professors and, uh, and allowing more students to go to universities and colleges here in Illinois and addressing the, uh, the affordability issue, I think all that contributes to the economy and helps to build up to where, we, uh, where we'd like to be and where we probably were a number of years ago. You want to add anything? Well, I'll just add this point. Businesses look for stability at some level, and the fact that we are having part of this discussion up here about what's going to happen with the taxes and the budget shows you that this Illinois is not a stable system, if you will, at this point. Uh, and it, you've got to get it stabilized one way or the other. I mean, businesses can basically adapt to just about anything if they could, it's predictable. It's the unpredictability that really causes them to flee or, or look to go to Iowa or Indiana versus Illinois. Uh, so that. We have to get that. We as a state have to get that uh, in place, and then deal with the debt. That's it. Businesses will tell you that they put the tax rate wherever you want. I mean, they don't say that, but but just for the assumption here. Uh, but then, how are you going to handle the debt? That that um, those the unfunded liabilities out there for the pensions, if because they're they're there. Uh, and how are you going to have the unpaid bills? You know, are you, are you going to be sticking us with another tax, uh, you know, next year or the year after uh, on top of, of making this permanent? So uh, there's a lot of that's that stuff has to be addressed. And uh, unlike, uh, you know, our neighboring states, Indiana, Wisconsin, which people point to, uh, they never got themselves into the hole that we did. They went through the same economic times, but they did not dig themselves into the hole that, that Illinois did, and that's, that's a real drag. With that, we might have time for one more quick question. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, would each of the, the uh, panel handicap the governor race real quick? <laughs> <laughs> <You> go first. <laughs> <laughs> Man, um, I think it's close either way. I think it comes down to a two or three point race. Um, you know, uh, I think the governor is going to need a lot of help. And I think he's, we're starting to see him. Mean, everybody's talked about the ballot initiatives and other ways that they're going to really try and move this ground game to get voters to the poll. I mean, there certainly are a sufficient number of Democrats to, to elect Pat Quinn. Uh, whether or not they're motivated to come to the polls are uh, the question. And I think, um, you know, on the opposite side, uh, Bruce Rauner, uh, he's got, you know, unlimited resources to shape his message to attack Governor Quinn in much the same way that we saw that uh, Governor Blagojevich did when uh, a number of years ago. So uh, it's going to be, you know, money against the ground game, and uh, I think at the end it's going to be close. Um, hard to say who, how, how it turns out. 
Um, I guess if I had to bet your paycheck, Bob, today, um, I would probably bet on Rauner. Um, if you look at the numbers from four years ago, um, Quinn won by you know, roughly 19,000 votes. Uh, you had Bill Brady, who was a very social conservative, wasn't real comfortable up in the Chicago area, really lost it, I, I would say, in the last seven to 10 days of the election. There was a big push uh, by President Obama and some robocalls and coming in and doing things. Um, you know, this time, and, and as Jim said, you're right, if you remember the Edgar Netz race or the Blagojevich, the Pinka race, where you had one side just completely blow the other one out early because of money, you're not gonna have that happen. Uh, Rauner is a fiscal conservative, but a social moderate, um, which I think plays to the suburbs, um, you know, where really the battle is going to be. If, if you look at numbers, um, where you need to be, a Republican to be successful needs 20% in the city of Chicago. Uh, Brady got about 17.5. And then Brady underperformed in suburban Cook County. He did fine, uh, you know, in the collar counties and downstate. And, and, you know, Brady was a downstate candidate, whereas you have Rauner being uh, a suburbanite himself. And as Jim said, you know, a, a lot of money. I don't think it's going to be necessarily money versus a ground game because I, I think Pat Quinn will probably raise and spend 30 or $40 million. Um, you know, you have potential this could be the first hundred million dollar race in Illinois history and I, and I know both from the RGA and the DGA side uh, this is the Democrat Governor Association Arkansas and Illinois the top two seats that they want to protect the RGA has this on you know one of their top pickups so uh, there'll be plenty of money on both sides and and you know ultimately I, I would just say um, you know, Pat Quinn, while, while people may think he's, you know, was an accidental governor because he came in when Bogoyevich was gone or he kind of stumbles or is ineffective, um, he's a very, very good campaigner, number one. But I think the other issue that you've seen is, is Pat Quinn is always known to be honest. Everyone thinks he's that. And you've seen the recent scandals with the neighborhood recovery and the hiring at IDOT that I think are maybe starting to, to chip away at that a little bit or give people pause. And, and I think Bruce Rauner's got the money. So, you know, again, it, I think it's going to be a close race, but I would have to bet on Rauner at this point. Yeah, today it's Rauner. Uh, for the reasons he just said, uh, it's going to be a Republican year. Uh, nation nationally, I don't know how much it'll be here. Uh, certainly, the, the Democrats will continue to control both chambers of the General Assembly. That, so that's that's not a factor, um, and maintain a majority of Congress. But nationally, that the trend is going to be Republican. Uh, that that will help Rauner. Uh, I think there's probably some fatigue of any governor after six years, and they certainly haven't been good years. I mean, blame Quinn or not blame Quinn, they, you can't look back and say they've been great years for Illinois. Uh, a lot of things played into it. So I think there there'll be some fatigue out there as well. But this will be the most expensive race Illinois has ever seen. If the country, if not, if not the country, I don't know, there might be some California races that, are, that they won't surpass. But uh, you'll see wall-to-wall -wall TV commercials, and your mailbox will be full of uh, less than flattering characterizations <laughs> of the various candidates. Uh, I think you can count on that. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, who does that drive the turnout? And uh, as we've talked, all these other things are all aimed at trying to get people to come out and vote and uh, part of that's going to be just to scare the bejesus out of you about the other candidates so uh, it won't be pretty but it'll it's coming and our rounders might be and the uh, hour of nine o'clock has now approached uh, so thank you very much to jim mark and zach for taking time out of this uh, busy busy time of year so thanks again